Okay, everybody. So good to see you. So the first stories that I'd like to share with you are about a very, very special tzaddik. Okay? Now, I know that on Lag Bomer, we all know that the holy tzaddik, Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai, was the one who was nifter, and we make a very, very big deal about Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai. But I want to tell you about another tzaddik that also was nifter on the day of Lag Bomer. And this tzaddik didn't live as long ago as Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai, who lived almost, almost 2,000 years ago. But this tzaddik lived almost 500 years ago. And this tzaddik is a tzaddik that I'm sure many of your abbas and many of your imas have heard of, and could be you have heard of him as well. His name is the Ramah. The Ramah is known as Rabbi Moshe Isserlish. Rabbi Moshe Isserlish was a big tzaddik who lived in Europe. And Rabbi Moshe gewalt the holy Ramah. Well, I want to tell you a little bit about him because he did something that was so amazing that it literally, I, I cannot even imagine how much nachas and how happy it made Hashem and Shemayim because he did something that was probably one of the hardest things in the world to do. And that was, he did an incredible act of chesed, of anava, of bittel. What, is, what am I talking about? What are you talking about, Yehuda? Well, let me tell you. First of all, you might have heard my brother, if you listen to some of his stories, Rabbi Yaakov Reis, he loves telling a story about the Holy Rabbi Shalom Shachna of Krakow, of Lublin, sorry. And the Holy Rabbi Shalom Shachna was the father-in-law of Rabbi Moshe Isserlish. Rabbi Moshe Isserlish, he began to learn Torah, and he learned Torah of Nigla and Torah of Nister, and he learned all types of Torah from all the Svarim. And he saw there was a famous sefer known as the Tur, known as the Arba Turim. These Arba Turim are all about the halachas from what do you do when you wake up in the morning? What do you do when you go to sleep at night? What do you do if you want to buy some piece of property? If you want to get married, if somebody's being born, if somebody's dying, if somebody's getting married, if somebody's having a bar mitzvah, if somebody wants to um, you know, eat matzah and sukkahs. Anything that you want to know is in these four halakim. And he wrote a beautiful, say, a beautiful pirish on there, known as the Darke Moshe. And at the same time that he was living in Europe, in Lublin, far, far away in, sorry, in, in, he was in Krakow, far, far away in Eretz Yisrael, near where we live, up in Sfas, there was another tzaddik. And this tzaddik, is known as the Beis Yosef, Rabbi Yosef Karo. The, base, the reason why he's called the Beis Yosef is because he also decided to write a pirush on the tour, an explanation on this, explaining the words of the holy tour. And his sefer was called the Beis Yosef, and that's what we call him. One night, both of these two tzaddikim said, you know, mm, this sefer that I wrote as a pirush on the tour is good, but imagine if I wrote all the halachas very clearly for everybody who lives near me. And they could have the clear halachas so that they all would know what's going on. Sorry, we just got to admit everybody else. And let's set it up so that they all can come in right away. Okay, welcome to all the people that are just joining in. Sorry that we missed you a little bit. So we were just talking about the holy tzaddik, the Ramah, Rabbi Moshe Isselish. And at the same time that the Ramah, Rabbi Moshe Isselish, was writing a, a pirush, an, an explanation on the words of the holy tour in Krakow, there's another tzaddik in Eretz Yisrael in the holy city of Tzfas by the name of Rabbi Yosef Karo, and he wrote a pirush called the Beis Yosef. And both of these two big tzaddikim had an idea. Hmm. What if we would write a pirush for all the Jews that they could know exactly what they should do? Because it's hard to learn the Gemara and then all the Rishonim and then all everybody and to know exactly what I'm supposed to do at every time. Imagine if we just he just wrote it in a way that everybody could know exactly what it is that they need to do. And both of these tzaddikim at the same time started writing a monumental sefer. And you might have heard of it because now it's known as the Shulchan Aruch. But they each were writing it at the same time. What's going to be? Well, 
One day, Ramosha Isalish is sitting in his house, and a man comes to his, comes to the town, and he says, "I'm collecting money from from Eretz Yisrael." And Ramosha Isalish says, "A guest from Eretz Yisrael? I'm so excited!" And he goes and he makes a big suda, and he and his wife they bring out some chicken and some rice and some bread, and they make a nice big suda, a nice beautiful feastala. And the man said, wow, thank you so much. Not only did you help me collect the money, but you're also putting out a whole feast for me in honor of a year from Eretz Yisrael. I, you set the table for me. I want to give a set table for you. And he pulls out from his bag a set of Shulchan Aruch. The Shulchan Aruch that was written by Rabbi Yosef Karo. And he says, look, it's, the Shulchan Aruch is called a set table, so every Jew knows what to do. Now, Ramosha Isolish didn't tell anybody that he had written a sefer just the same. And he was getting ready to print it. And Ramosha Isolish starts learning through the sefer all night long. And in one night, he goes from the beginning all the way to the end of the Shulchan Aruch. And he says, this is amazing. But I have two problems. The first problem is I also wrote a Sefer like this. Should I put out my Sefer? I worked so many years, so many years to write an incredible Sefer like this. Should I, if I put mine out, then all the Jews are not going to know which one to listen to. Should they even learn this Sefer? That's all the Halachas. Or should they learn my Sefer, which is all the Halachas? Mm. He didn't know what to do. And he said, you know something? I can't, I can't put out a sefer that's going to be against this other tzaddik. And so he took all of his writings that he had written for years, and he went to the cemetery where they bury all the yidin that die. And he said, I'm going to bury my sefer along with all the yidin. And he saw there was a tree there a young little tree that was growing. And he said, this is going to, I'm going to mark it by this tree overlooking the cemetery. And he dug a deep hole and he put his sefer in there. And he went back to his house and he said, you know what I'm going to do? Instead of writing, putting out my sefer, I'm going to write because there's a second problem with the sefer from the base Yosef known as the Shulchan Aruch. That's, he wrote the halachos in general for the people that come from the lands of Sfarah, known as Sfardim. And in, in Europe, we have a little bit of different halachas. We paskin differently. So I'm going to do is I'm going to write notes on every piece that that tzaddik, the Beis Yosef wrote. I'm going to write a couple of notes to explain it for all the Eden. And I'll tell you, you could look in any page of Shulchan Aruch. You could look on any page of Shulchan Aruch. And you can, and you can see that there's what we call the machaber. That's the big words. And then there's a note. And that's what we say is the Rama. And amazing, amazing. What an incredible bittal that this tzaddik had. That instead of writing his own sefer, which he worked for so many years and let it be so chashav, he's just known as the footnotes on the Shulchan Aruch. But Kavalt, because of this, all the Jews across the world all learn the same Shulchan Aruch. Everybody agreed to it. There was no separation. There was no saying, oh, you learned this one, but we learned this one. Everybody learns it. Now, there are many tzaddikim that disagree and say, oh, we don't actually do it this way or that way. And that's why we have a Mishnah Brura and we have an Aruch HaShulchan and we have all the, call them the nice Kalim, right? Because they carry all the different Kalim that come to the table because the Shulchan Aruch is a set table. So all the Mepharshim, all the ones that explain the Shulchan Aruch are called the nice Kalim. And it's Gevalt. We have so many tzaddikim and so many different understandings, but we all learn from one place. And that's an incredible, incredible thing. So let me tell you a little bit also, what happened? This tzaddik, because he wrote it, and remember he buried all of his writings by that tree? Well, when it came time for him to die, he told everybody, he said, I want you to know that I want to be buried under this tree, this special tree. Now, the only person who knew about this whole story was the man who was the caretaker of the cemetery. 
And when the Holy Rama died, he said, I want you to know that many years ago when that guest from Eretz Yisrael came and he brought the Shulchan Aruch, the Holy Rama, the Holy Rabbi Moshe Israelish, he went and he took all of his writings that he had been working on for so many years and he buried them under this tree. And that's why the Rama said that I want to be buried here now as well. So, give me one second. Sorry, everybody. And so they buried the Holy Rabbi Moshe there. And I want you to know that many people, many of the big tzaddikim, have said that this Holy Rabbi Moshe, they say from Moshe Rabbeinu until Rabbi Moshe ben Maimon, who's known as the Rambam, there was never a Moshe like that, Gaval, such a holy Moshe. And you should know from the times of the Rambam, the holy Reb Moshe ben Maimon, all the way to the times of Reb Moshe Israelish, there was never a Moshe like them either. Very, very special tzaddik. Now, before the Ramah died, we're going to get back to what happened when he died. Before the Ramah died, he was in his house, and that same guest came from Eretz Yisrael years after that first time. And the holy Reb Moshe said, I want you to know that I have some, a gift for you to give back to Reb Yosef Karo back in Tzvas. Can you take it back for me? And he said, sure. He said, and here's a set of Shulchan Aruch with my notes for all the Jews that live in Europe. Whoa. When he brought it back, he gave it to Rabbi Yosef Karo. Rabbi Yosef Karo was also a lot older and he was shocked and he recognized right away what must have happened. That this Sadik Ramesha Isolish must have written a Sefer just like him. And instead of putting it out so that it should be a Machlikis, he did it together. Could you imagine? Rabbi Yosef Karo was blown away. And he said, this is incredible. And he took a hundred gold dinars. And he went and he said, I want somebody to write me a Sefer Torah right now. And I want to send this Sefer Torah as a gift to the Holy Ramah, the Holy Rabbi Moshe Isolish. Now, if you remember, I told you about that tree that was in the cemetery. Well, that tree, that tree got bigger and stronger and huge tree in the Krakow ghetto, in the Krakow cemetery. And it was on Lagba Omer many years ago. This is, must be in the 1500s. Let me see if I could find what, his, what, name, what year it was. It was in the year 1572. This holy tzaddik was Nifter and he died. And as I told you before, he wanted to be, be buried underneath the tree. And they did. They buried him there. And it got, this tree got even bigger and even stronger. And they, all the Eden would come there every single Lagba Omer to celebrate the covet of Reb Shimon Bar Yechai and the covet of their tzaddik, Reb Moshe Israelish. And one year, there were so many Eden. They said, this tree is just getting in the way. Bring the axes. We want to have a simcha. We're cutting down this tree. And suddenly, the skies darkened. And a storm came. And every, the, all the men, as they came to try to cut the tree, they just got blown away. One person got blown away this way, and one person got blown away that way. And Gavalt, they said, we better not touch this tree. This tree is a special tree. Now, Hevra, I want you to know that when the Nazis came during World War II, and they came to the city of Krakow, they came and they destroyed the whole cemetery. They smashed all the matzevot that were there, all the, all the tombstones, and they tried to destroy the trees. They tried to destroy everything. But when the Yidin came after the war, a few of the survivors came home from the camps, and they came to that cemetery, and there was one stone that was still standing upright, and nobody was able to touch it. That stone, that stone, you can guess it, it was the stone of the Ramah, Reb Moshe Isolish. And the Goyim said that when the Nazis came and they were trying to destroy everything, the tree bent down and protected the caver of the Holy Ramah. I want you to know that not only does nature, nature, which we see that listens to Hashem, the, the yam of nature that's split by Moshe Rabbeinu when we wanted to cross, and when, when Nachshon ben Aminadav jumped in and he had Bittal, I want you to know that all of nature listens. When a Yid is able to be mevatel himself for the sake of not having machlokis, for the sake of not fighting, and we can make shalom, even with two tzaddikim that never saw each other from two sides of the world, a tzaddik that worked so many years, 
to bring kavod shemayim, to bring, give kavod to Hakadosh Baruch Hu by showing all the yidden how to keep halacha and what the right way to do it is. Gavalt, even from the other side of the world, he was mavatal. All of that, so there should be shalom. That Hashem, when He looks down, He should say, "Look at my children, my Am Yisrael, my Bnei Yisrael. They're all together. They're chas v'shalom. They're not fighting. There's no machlokas. There's no separations between my children." And I hope that all of you. In your homes as well, between your siblings, between all the brothers and sisters, you should also try to have shalom. You should know that your abbas and your imas in this world are going to be very, very thankful and very, very appreciative, and they're going to have so much nachas. But kaval Tashem and Shemayim, when he looks down, he says, "There's no kli, there's no vessel, there's no way to be able to accept the bracha from Hakadosh Baruch Hu like shalom." And I hope that all of us will be able to truly be able to have that shalom. Shalom, not just in our families, but with the whole world. Gewalt, Bezrat Hashem. We should be able to have some incredible shalom. And now we're going to do one more story, if you guys are all up for it. Are you up for hearing another story? Let me see some thumbs up. I want to see some thumbs. There we go. We got some thumbs. All right. We're going to do one more story. This story happened probably 150 years after this other story. That's pretty good. And it's actually going to be a continuation. I want to tell you a little bit more about these people. Um, even though we've been telling a lot of stories about the tzaddikim of Europe, maybe one day we'll get to also tell some of the stories of the tzaddikim of Svarad, which that could be nice, Bezrat Hashem. And so the story that I'm going to tell you today, for those that were here at the beginning of the week, I had to jump in because somebody else didn't make it to tell the story. So I told the story about Rabbi Adam Baal Shem Tov. So I'm going to remind you all who we're talking about. We're talking about a, the tzaddikim. We started off talking about Rabbi Leo Baal Shem Tov, who was 200 years before Rabbi Yisrael Baal Shem Tov, who we all know as the Baal Shem Tov. And we had Rabbi Leo, and we have Rabbi Yoel, and we have Rabbi Adam. Now, this story about Rabbi Adam was, there's a couple of really good ones, and this is one of those good ones. And hopefully one day we'll get to tell you all of them. But this is one of those good ones. So listen closely. During those times, there was a king. And this king, he had a minister. And the king, was he good? Was he bad? He definitely didn't love the, B'nai, the, the Eden. He didn't love the, the B'nai Israel that were in, in Europe. But he wasn't so against them either. But he wanted this, this advisor, this minister, he really hated the Jews. He was uh, like a real Haman, you know? One of those evil guys. Well, one time, Rabbi Adam Baal Shem Tov, he came in to the king. And he wanted to build a relationship with the king and get to know the king because the king would make many decrees against the Jews. And so Rabbi Adam came to try to show him. And Rabbi Adam knew some pretty wild things. So Rabbi Adam came in and he said, I would love to show you something special. So the king said, what would you like to show me? He says, go bring me an ax. So they bring an ax. He says, I want you to take, I'm going to take this ax and I'm going to chop off my leg. And this servant who comes over with the ax says, I, 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 I don't want to do it. Rabbi Adam says, don't worry. It's going to be fine. And everybody's looking. Are you kidding me? Chop off his leg. This is crazy. So the, the man was shaking. And he said, come on, just do it. Finally, one of the soldiers said, I'll do it. And he picks the ax up. And he chops off Rabbi Adam's leg. And suddenly there's blood. And everybody's screaming. Rabbi Adam says, don't worry, don't worry. Go get me. Get me a dough from the kitchen. Before that, they're making into bread. And they bring the dough, and he puts the dough on his leg, and goes back together. Everybody's looking. <laughs> this is crazy. What kind of tricks are these? But this minister is watching this whole thing, and he goes, mm, "I don't like this one. This is getting. This is gonna. The, I know the king's gonna start liking this Jew. He's doing some crazy tricks. I don't know how he does these tricks, but he's gonna like him." And so this minister says. After Rabbi Adam says, you know, thank you, thank you for having me. So he says, what do you think is a proper way to, that this guy should say thank you to the king? I think if the king had him over to the palace, maybe this man should have the king over to his house. 
And of course, the minister knew that he lived in, this Jew lived in the ghetto with all the other Jews in a little hut. And so the king said, what a fine idea. Rabbi Adam, are you accepting? And Rabbi Adam said, for sure. And the minister said, mm -hmm, I know this is going to be an embarrassment for the king and the king is going to take punishment and revenge on all the Jews in the whole kingdom. This is a good plan. <laughs> well, about they made a plan. It was going to be a certain date that Rabbi Adam said that you should come. And so the minister sent a spy. Go check Rabbi Adam's house. And they come to the house, and there's Rabbi Adam sitting with a big Gemara in front of him, and he's just learning from that Gemara. And the minister says to the king, you know, I think this Rabbi Adam is trying to make a fool of you. He's not getting anything prepared. He's not putting up a tent. He's not making a big party. And the king said, I'm sure it's going to be okay. But day after day, week after week, as it was getting closer and closer to the party, the minister kept on sending spies and he kept on saying, I'm just telling you, king, that if he makes a fool of you, this is not just him. This is all the Jews. All the Jews really just want to embarrass you and they want to make a joke out of you. They're not even going to prepare nothing. And the king started to get worried and the king started to say, you really think so? Well, if they make fun of me, if they make a joke out of me, I'll make a joke out of all the Jews. And slowly the minister was making his anger. But the king, he's like, really, is this going to happen? The day comes and they start traveling. And early in the morning, the minister sends a spy in there in Rabbi Adam's little house. Rabbi Adam's sitting there with a huge Gemara. And the minister is like, that's it. This once and for all, we're going to get those Jews. And as they're coming, the king and the minister is whispering in the king's ear all sorts of words of poison. Poison like a snake. Oh, those Jews are going to make fun. It's going to be a joke and they're going to embarrass you, but you're going to take such revenge on them. But you could imagine their surprise when as the king with all of his servants and the soldiers turned down that little street to get to Rabbi Adam's little house, their eyes went, <whistles> their jaws dropped. There was a huge palace. This palace wasn't just a beautiful palace. We were talking. Servants running around outside and coming to collect all the horses and to bring them in. And this palace was gorgeous. Hevra. I'm telling you, they had an aquarium. You could imagine that in these times, they didn't even know what an aquarium was. I'm talking about a huge crystal aquarium where the fish were swimming from one room into the other through the dining area and the tables were set with beautiful tablecloths and crystal and every fork and knife was made out of silver and gold and Rabbi Adam invited everyone in and said I'm so happy you could make it to this wonderful party and they all couldn't believe their eyes and Rabbi Adam said one thing be very careful do not take anything from this party don't put one goblet or one fork or spoon into your pockets you everything you can eat but it must go back and the servants come from the kitchens and they bring out roast duck and and uh, corned beef and the most perfectly smoked pastrami and breads that looked like little wagons mm. and the drinks the wine mm, such good wine and it was an apple juice the best apple juice. And the king was blown away. And of course, Rabbi Adam entertained them all. And he's telling, the, he's, he's, you know, telling them stories. And he turns to the king and he says, Oh, king, is there anything special that maybe I could show you? And the king says, you know, I'm a king. What really would impress me would be if you can show me a king. Can you show me one of the Jewish kings? I want to sing David HaMelech. And Rabbi Adam said, mm, I don't think that would be a good idea. But there is one of the King David's, uh, David HaMelech's generals, was known as Ben Yao Ben Yayada. To show you David HaMelech, that'd be too much. But I can show you this general, this soldier of David HaMelech. 
And so they brought out a big table with a purple tablecloth. And on top of this table, Rabbi Adam Baal Shem puts a big jug down on the middle of the table. And suddenly the jug begins to get bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. And from the top of the jug where the opening is, suddenly they see a helmet coming out the top, an old metal helmet. And there you begin to see a forehead and eyes and a face with a big beard. And a soldier, big soldier steps out from there. And this soldier gave such fear into every person that was there. The servants ran out of the room. The people started, <laughs> they, their feet started to chatter, to shake. Their knees were clicking together under the table. Their teeth were chattering. And they saw this such a frightening. We're talking about a tzaddik. Yisoyed Olam, ben Yo, ben Yayada, Ishchael, strong. And, and he, as he looked around the room, they were all just terrified. And the king screamed and said, put him back, put him back, put him back. And immediately Rabbi Adam said something. And Ben Yo, Ben Yayada, this image of Ben Yo, Ben Yayada, steps back into the thing and slowly shrinks down and the huge jug begins to shrink back down to its regular size. Everybody's hearts were thumping. And they were so scared. They were so frightened. They were so blown away by such an incredible experience. <sighs> Rabbi Adam said, bring out dessert. And they brought it out, but still the people were so scared. And Rabbi Adam said, I want to show something special. Bring around the table, bring my special bag. And they brought the special bag of Rabbi Adam. And Rabbi Adam said, we're going to start with the most simple servant that you brought, my royal king. And the simple servant put his hand into the bag and took out. And there was a few coins. And as he began to go to the next person, the person reached in their bag and this one put out a precious stone. This one got a ruby and this one got a diamond. And as it began to go up to the to the, to the princes and the princesses, they pulled out a diamond covered in rubies and all sorts of gems. Another one pulled out a beautiful tichel with laced with diamonds and, and sapphires and emeralds. And finally, it comes to the king. And the king had gotten a beautiful ring. But there was one person who went last, and that was the evil minister. And this evil minister, when he put his hands into the bag and he took his hands out, they were covered in poop. Ugh! And the poop smelled. And as he tried to wipe it off, it just got more and more and more. And I know this is crazy, but this is the story. I have to tell it to you the way I heard it. I hope that nobody gets upset at me, but that's the truth. And it stunk. And the king started to yell, get him out of here. This is gross. And the more he tried to clean it off, the more he tried to wash it off, the more smelly and nasty it got. And the king looked at Rabbi Adam and said, what's going on? Why, why did this happen to him? He said, I want you to know that I try to do things for people, but for each person, I need to look into their heart and find something special in their heart. But this man... He's so mean. All he wanted to do was to make bad things happen to all the Jews. And he's been telling you lies about me this whole time. And what could I do? What was deep, deep in his heart is just poop. So that's what's all over his hands. And all the people were laughing and all the kids were pointing. And so they said, how can you get it off? So Rabbi Adam said, it's a little gross, but you have to go to the streets and maybe find a Jew that will pish on your hands. And if he pishes on your hands, it'll get clean. <laughs> that's the story. What can I tell you? I can't change the rude details to try to make it any better, but that's what happened. He had to go out and somebody had to pish on his hands. It was so gross. But it got it all clean. Well, the king... He heard when Rabbi Adam said not to take anything, but he took two goblets, two special crystal goblets. Now, these goblets weren't just made out of crystal for wine. They had gold and silver decorations around it. He had never seen a goblet like this in his entire life. And he took them home with him. And he was very happy with Rabbi Adam. From then on, 
Rabbi Adam was welcome. And if there was any decrees, Rabbi Adam would come in and talk to the king. And sometimes when the king needed advice, Rabbi Adam would be the one that he would ask. Well, one time Rabbi Adam gets a message. Come, you must come right now to the king. And he comes straight to the king, to the palace. And there he is by the king. And the king looks at Rabbi Adam, he says, and the king looks very worried. Rabbi Adam said, what's wrong, my royal king? He says, I just got a letter. A declaration of war from a kingdom far away. And this king wants to come and destroy us. What should I do? Should I fight back? How am I going to get the help? I'm going to need to get other kings to fight with me against this very strong king. Rabbi Adam looks at him. And the king says, what's that look, Rabbi Adam? You have an answer for me? And he says, I want you to know. Remember when I made that special party for you, that special Suda, and you came? Well, you took two goblets. How dare you say such a thing to me, Adam Baal Shem? How dare you say such a thing? You, are you, you, you saying that I stole? Rabbi Adam said, no, you didn't want to steal it. You just took it because it was so fantastic. I know that you didn't even, you don't even use them, but you have them in one of your drawers, right? The king said, Rabbi Adam said, may I go to that drawer and open it? The king said, okay. Rabbi Adam goes and he opens the drawer and there he pulls out the two cups. He says, I want to tell you a little secret. When I made that special Suda for you, the truth is, is that I didn't make it myself. On that day, there was a special, special meeting that was supposed to be between two kings in a faraway place. And that king had prepared for six months building this palace that you saw. And with all the aquariums and with all the jewels and all the food, and they prepared it for this special party. And Hashem gave me the koach that I was able to make that whole castle come right to my house. And when they went there for their party, there was no party there. You, my royal king, you had that party. You should send a letter to this faraway king and tell them that you have a Jew among your people that was able to take that entire party on this and that, this day. Do you remember? I'm right. Say to that king, do you remember that? And to prove it to you, here I have one of the goblets and I will send one to you. And send it with a messenger. And tell that king that he better not fight a war with you because you see how powerful one of your Jews are. The king was shocked and he said, okay. And so he sent this letter to this faraway king with the goblet. And when that king saw the goblet and he, when he read the letter, he remembered that party that was supposed to happen. And all they knew was that from midday until the next day, the, ca- the palace was gone. And when he had come back the next day, it looked like there was a big party there. But when they came, there was nobody to see it. And it was a wondrous experience to them even though he was very upset about it and now when this king sent him this letter so he sent back this faraway king sent back a letter said okay we will be in peace together and we won't fight and once again Rabbi Adam saved the king and the king said to Rabbi Adam you're one unique guy I don't know what's with you but I don't know how to make heads or tails of this but it's pretty amazing and so Rabbi Adam was able to protect the Jews during those times, protect them from any evil decrees and from any crazy bad things to happen to them. And he, was able, he had the ear of the king, as they say. The king listened to him, both for advice and to watch over the Jews. So I hope that all of you enjoyed these stories. I hope that you all had a great time listening. I know that I enjoyed sharing these stories with you. And while the second story was quite wondrous and quite fantastical, and it's a lot of fun to listen to, I think the one story that really sticks with me, and I want you to remember that as you walk away from here, was that incredible, incredible mitzvah that Holy Rama, Rav Moshe Isolish did. How he was able to give up so many years of his work, so many years of hard work, learning and writing, but to have shalom. And I bless you all, and I bless myself and all of us together that we should really have shalom 
shalom with our siblings and shalom with other yidin around the world. And even if you see somebody who doesn't like what you're doing or he doesn't think like you or he doesn't dress like you or in any way, just remember the most important thing and the biggest kli that can hold bracha in the whole world is shalom. Chaim. And I hope that we'll all, when we're, when we're faced with such a, such a moment of, you know, challenges and we're choosing something that maybe is really hard, putting our own things on the side for the sake of Shalom, I hope that we'll all have the koach to do it. Gewalt Eden. Have a wonderful day.